very soon we will be able to meet either in Indonesia or in Spain. I would like to express, first of all, uh, my satisfaction for the fact that the Center for Strategic and International Studies, ANCASA Asia, are going ahead with this forum. This forum was um, something that uh, numerous actors, at least in Spain, and particularly regional level, the uh, government of Catalonia, and at city council level, two city councils, Barcelona and Madrid. So it's a unique structure, and um, we hope to continue this fruitful cooperation with the CIS in the coming uh, years. In 2021, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of Casa Asia. So uh, this is a, another opportunity to uh, underline the importance of public diplomacy and particularly the role that Casa Asia has played in the last 20 years to promote common understanding and dialogue between Asia and the Pacific region on one side and Spain on the other. Casa Asia has uh, been offering, and now I'm referring particularly to Indonesia, Bahasa language courses in the last few years, and also a wide range of activities related to the culture, economics, social affairs of that country. So we will continue this line of action. The difference is that with this forum, we move from scattered actions to a platform which takes place every year and somehow channels all the activities in the case of the seas related to Spain and in the case of Casa Asia related to uh, Indonesia. To uh, finish my uh, introductory uh, remarks, I would like to um, commend the efforts of those institutions, public and private, which have made possible this second edition of the forum. And I wish, the wish that um, next year in 2023, we will be able to hold this uh, dialogue in a face-to-face -face format, or at least in a hybrid manner, so that uh, we can invite our Indonesian friends to Madrid and elsewhere, or go to uh, Jakarta uh, to hold this session. We could not have uh, chosen a better partner, so thank you, Satis, Dr. Fitriani, Dr. Rital, for uh, your uh, remarks, uh, for your support, and um, uh, we are looking forward for a fruitful discussion. I hope you find this session interesting. Thank you very much for Madrid, and back to you, Dr. Fitriani. Thank you, uh, Mr. Javier Porondo, uh, for your remarks. It's excellent. Um, I hope it can serve us for the knowledge of this upcoming session. Uh, first, we would have a brief update um, on Indonesia and Spain relations. Uh, I would like to call um, Mr. Vidya Sadnovic. Director for European Affairs One from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia uh, to give his take on the situation of Indonesia Spain relations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tiffany. Uh, good morning. Uh, 
Direct Regional for North America, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Pacific, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and Old Region of Spain. His Excellency Ambassador Francisco Diaz Aguilera Amiga, Ambassador of Spain for Indonesia, Dr. Philip Spertamonte, Chief Director of ESIS Indonesia, Mr. Javier Marondo, Director General of Class ASEAN, Distinguished Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'd like to take this opportunity to express how happy we are to facilitate continuous interactions between the two countries, the two CSIS, CSIS Indonesia and ASEAN, Asia, and to thank them for organizing the second Indonesia Spanish Forum. I extend my appreciation to all the speakers and participants joining us uh, today. It is a great pleasure uh, to join this forum, and hopefully this conversation will innovatively unlock potential areas for our bilateral cooperation and identify strategies to enhance it. Well, we hope that everyone involved today will be able not only to provide expert insights, but most importantly, give a gift that will lead us to complete cooperation to further strengthen cooperation for mutual benefits. Since the first event last year, we have seen that the pandemic situation has significantly improved. Although there are no room for complacency, and we should continue cooperation to make sure no one is left behind. As we have gained momentum to enhance economic recovery, we are, especially Europe, is facing geopolitical challenges and hot war, perhaps the worst after the COVID. As we gradually readjust to the new normal, open our borders for tourism, we should ensure that these activities continue. We should also work together to ensure that the hot war is stopped immediately and territorial integrity should be restored in accordance with international law and the UN Charter. These conversations should bring closer Indonesia and Spain. The pandemic gave us a crucial lesson to learn that no countries in the world are well prepared. Therefore, international cooperation is very crucial. Based on the international cooperation, we have been able to take necessary measures mitigating the pandemic, strengthening our vaccination program, and implementing street health protocols. More than 78% of Indonesian populations are fully vaccinated. And we are currently administering booster shots. Allow me to take this opportunity to also express our appreciation to Spain's contributions of uh, 600,000 doses of vaccines to COVID capacity. As we start focusing on economic recovery, we are confronted with the effects of the war in the country. We have witnessed the significant impacts to the developing countries on food and energy security, including potential sabotage. It will be worsened by the economic sanction if the war prolongs, including the global peace and security. It will cause a world economic crisis and trigger costly humanitarian crisis. From the beginning, Indonesia has been consistent in that sovereignty and territorial integrity of sovereign states must be upheld and restored. The war should stop immediately and humanitarian crisis be addressed. The parties should continue their negotiations to find solutions to stop the war and to maintain peace and stability. The situation in Ukraine has already undermined economic growth and disrupted economic recovery. IMF has warned that the situation in Ukraine will set back global recovery. The world anticipates a significant drop in 2020 from an estimated 6.1% in 2021 to 3.6% in 2022 and 2023. The increase in fuel and food prices have triggered inflation and have hit low-income countries. Indonesia is in better position with a small decrease of 0.1% on our estimated economic growth in 2022. With strong domestic consumption and export, Indonesia's economy will grow by 5.4% this year. Indonesia's G20 presidency has set three priorities under the theme Recover Together, Recover Stronger. The first is strengthen health infrastructure, second, the energy transition, and the third, digital transformation. These are not only Indonesia's priorities, but also global priorities, particularly the developing countries. Indonesia is committed to maintain the integrity of the G20 as the premier forum for international economic cooperation and provide concrete solutions to 
address global problems, including the global economic repercussions of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia and Spain enjoy a strong bond based on mutual respect and trust. We share values of democracy and respect for humanities, multilateralism, and common pursuit for sustainable development. Spain is also an important partner in developing strategic industries in Indonesia and one of the largest trading partners in Europe. And please do note that despite the pandemic, the value of our bilateral trade grew by more than 53% last year. However, the value of Indonesian exports to Spain is less than 0.5% of the total Spanish import and vice versa. I would like to invite and encourage, encourage Spanish entities to invest in Indonesia more and take advantage of our huge domestic markets and its regional impact. Indonesia is part of 600 million strong SM market. It is also part of the ASEP, the world's biggest comprehensive economic uh, partnership agreement, of about 29.6% of the world population and 32.2% of global GDP. And we are optimistic that the conclusion of the Indonesian EU TEPA will significantly facilitate trade and investment between Indonesia and Spain. Although our bilateral relations have a positive trajectory, we must continue to find creative ways to boost cooperation. The current crisis shows the crucial partnerships between Indonesia and Indonesia. Bilateral trade must be promoted, and we should avoid unnecessary discrimination and protectionism. Global supply chain must be diversified to avoid disruptions caused by geopolitical tensions. Indonesia and EU Japan negotiations must facilitate for an early conclusion. We also look forward to strengthen further Indonesia and EU partnerships. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this year's theme of the forum is digital innovation to overcome COVID. I am glad to announce the conclusions of the agreement to the interoperability of the digital instruments between Indonesia and the EU Commission. Digital ecosystem is Indonesia's uh, rapidly growth and provided new source of growth. Currently, there are eight unicorns and two decacorns in Indonesia. More than 70 million medium and small medium enterprises in Indonesia have embraced digitalization. McKinsey predicts Indonesia's digital economy we will be able to reach uh, 150 billion US dollars by 2025, or 10% of our GDP. We must also leverage digitalization to further Indonesia Spain economy cooperation. Digital platforms can help businesses connect and show their, showcase their products. In this context, the ministry has launched Inna Access, a web based platform to connect Indonesian business community with their counterpart abroad. Spanish businessmen, uh, Spanish businessmen and companies will find products, investment projects, and travel packages facilitated virtually on the platform. I'm also pleased that Indo Pacific will be the subject for conversation in forum. It is crucial to synergize the ASEAN outlook on the Indo Pacific and the EU strategy for cooperation in Indo Pacific. We should implement a vision of peace, security, prosperity of the Indo Pacific. Strengthen ASEAN like mechanism and ASEAN centrality is crucial for partnership in the Indo-Pacific. We should create an enabling environment to enhance further partnership in the Indo-Pacific. Indonesia is ready to work with the EU, in particular uh, Spain, to undertake the cooperation in the priority areas of maritime cooperation, connectivity, SDGs 2030, and economic cooperation. I'm confident that this forum will strengthen our cooperation. The presence of prominent speakers and experts today will enrich the discussions and define new innovative ways to promote better cooperation. The presence of the uh, think tank as well as the uh, practitioners will contribute uh, to uh, lively discussions. Let's continue to explore the past potential with folks to realize. I wish you all a fruitful discussions and I thank you. Uh, back to you, Dr. Vivian. And thank you, Director Sadnovic, for your uh, brief presentation on Indonesia and relation. Now, I would like to invite His Excellency, uh, Mr. Javier Salido, Director General for North America, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Pacific, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain. 
to give his brief remarks. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Cipriani, and good afternoon and morning to you all, depending on whether you are in Indonesia and Spain. Uh, I would like to thank CSIS and CESA Asia for organizing this tribuna and also the, the, the speakers that will be intervening in the different panels today, um, particularly uh, His Excellency Ambassador Sohaya, Director General for uh, American and European Affairs in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Indonesia. I am very pleased for having this opportunity to closely engage with both officials and civil society representatives from Indonesia and Spain. One year has passed since our first tribuna, Indonesia, Spain, uh, and this edition will again have to be a virtual one. I hope that uh, as my colleague Javier Parrondo said before, uh, next time we'll be able to meet in person. Nevertheless, I am sure that this forum will serve its purpose of conveying our, our messages to each other and contributing towards a general goal of bringing together our people, academia, officials, businessmen, and business society actors. Spain recognizes Indonesia as an important player in the Indo-Pacific region with a central role in Southeast Asia, and, and we fervently wish to maintain the best bilateral relations. As a key member of the European Union, Spain supports that the EU should be not only a key economic actor in the Indo-Pacific, but also a political actor in the area, as is made clear by the European Union Indo-Pacific strategy that I'm sure will be discussed further in, the, in a specific session later today. Indonesia is a special country. It is the third largest democracy in the world and an example of tolerance and coexistence among multiple ethnic groups, cultural identities and religions. The recent COVID crisis has shown how we must face together common challenges. As the vaccination progress, the COVID epidemic seems finally to start being under control. Yet we will probably see still new waves of contagion where we'll achieve the much awaited immunization of our citizens. We will have to keep working together to face this challenge. As Ambassador Suhaya has mentioned before, we also live in a changing geopolitical order. Indonesia and Spain are both firm defenders of the UN charters and international law, a rules-based international order that is currently being challenged by the illegal and unprovoked aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Indonesia and Spain supported the UN General Assembly resolution on March 2nd that demand Russia to end the aggression and withdraw its forces from Ukraine. The invasion and the blockade of Ukraine ports is having global consequences, as we can see in the rising food prices that are threatening the lives of millions of people around the world. Let me be clear on this point. It is a war, not the sanctions that the European Union has imposed, the cost for the uh, risk of food security around the world. Spain is working closely with its partners and allies to support Ukraine and defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We hope to work closely with other relevant international players, such as Indonesia, in order to pressure Russia to stop this aggression as soon as possible. There are other important issues that we need to deal with together, such as climate change or gender equality. As you all know, Spain considers that the recovery policies must be sustainable and gender oriented. This is an opportunity we cannot miss to introduce the necessary reforms to make our economies cleaner and more efficient, our societies fairer to women and girls. I want in this, in this sense to highlight the fact that Indonesia is active in women in peace and security and gender issues related to peacekeeping operations, areas where we can further collaborate. Spain and Indonesia share the values and principles of multilateralism. We both participate in the G20 meetings. We frequently support each other in international candidacies, and we uphold democratic values and respect for human rights. Our economies need to restart their activities as soon as possible, avoiding unilateralism and protectionism. Connectivity is going to be key for the green recovery policies, and those connections have to ensure quality and sustainability according to international standards. But opening our economies will not be enough. We must ensure a level playing field, equal access to markets, and the protections of investments and intellectual property. For this reason, we strongly support making progress in the current negotiations of the EU-Indonesia free trade agreement. We believe that Spain and Indonesia are complementary economies, and we should deepen our, our relations. The external sector of our economies will be key in the post-COVID-19 recovery. Spanish company, companies are now better represented in Asia. 
They have been very competitive in markets such as Australia and the United States, which shows their quality and ability to offer tailor-made adapted solutions to specific needs of clients in a competitive environment. Despite in Indonesia economic importance, only some 80 Spanish companies maintain investments or stable commercial relations with Indonesia. These include important companies such as Repsol, Navantia, Indra, or Airbus, which with the construction, the joint construction program of the C-295 airplanes. However, other companies still find difficulties in operating in this market, and we need to cooperate in order to foster more investment. The path of economic reform and attraction of foreign investment may allow the presence of higher numbers of Spanish companies in areas such as infrastructure, renewable energies, and market integration. We should also strengthen our personal ties, not only between the public administrations and officials, but also between our businessmen, universities, and think tanks. Today's Tribuna is a good example. Tourism is an excellent way of bringing us closer together, getting to know each other better and deepening our relations. Up to the current health crisis, the number of travelers continue to grow in both directions, and we hope to recover those numbers very soon. Our historical ties will be also commemorated this year with the celebrations of the 500th anniversary of the first round the world voyage, which took Juan Sebastián Elcano to the coast of Molucas and Televis in what is now Eastern Indonesia. This fact initiated a first moment of contact between our peoples based on mutual recognition, cooperation and exchanges on an equal footing. The publication of the book in El Archipiélago de la Especiaría, Spain and Molucas in the 16th and 17th centuries will shed light on this historical event and cultural activities are being jointly developed by Spanish and Indonesian authorities and institutions, particularly in the Molucas. Finally, Spanish language is an asset for international trade and people-to-people -people relations. There are currently around 500 million native Spanish speakers in the world, making it the second most spoken language after Chinese. It is also the second most spoken language in the United States. Spain will continue to, have to, prom to promote Spanish language in Asia, through the activities of Instituto Cervantes and the Electorados de Aicid. In Indonesia, we also cooperate with the Diplomatic School of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And we hope that we can introduce Spanish as an optional second foreign language in the Indonesian formal education. We encourage the Indonesian authorities to explore venues for cooperation with the Ministry of Education. On a cultural level, I will also finally like to mention the publication of Don, on Don Quixote in Bahasa, which we hope will, will allow all Indonesians to better understand the culture and literature of Spain. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the debates today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your excellent uh, brief, uh, Your Excellency Salido. Um, thank you so much for your time. Now, without further ado, I would begin uh, this forum uh, to our first session that will be moderated by Mr. Rafael Bueno, Director of Education, Politics, and Society from Casa Asia, Spain. Um, Mr. Bueno, the screen is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Fitriani. Uh, thank you for introducing the speaker so we can save some time, uh, considering that we are a very tight schedule. So in this first session, we are going to discuss the challenges and opportunities that uh, then, uh, digital innovation can bring to our societies. And uh, I, will, I will change the order of our speakers for, for uh, well, they have some, some changes in their schedule also. So I will, I will give the floor first to uh, Ms. Uh, Liz Yogulan, uh, secondly to Marta Nueno Falguera, uh, third to Mr. Rafit Randi, uh, and finally, Raquel uh, Jorge, and uh, I will remind, uh, I would like to remind to all of you that uh, we have only five minutes for each speaker. So we can finish uh, by uh, 10.30 uh, maximum. So uh, Ms. Liz Yogulan, uh, the, the screen is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, I think I cannot turn on my uh, video. I need the operator to turn on the video. All right, thank you. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody here in Jakarta, Indonesia, and in Spain. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like, first of all, however, I'd like to uh, say our greatest appreciation and thank you to, of course, to uh, CSIS Casa Asia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Embassy of Spain. Uh, I'd like to uh, greet uh, 
His Excellency Ambassador Murat Sanjaya, as well as uh, His Excellency Ambassador of Spain, uh, Francisco Aguilera. Uh, just to, to respect everybody's time, uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, as the uh, technology company that works in uh, a lot in tourism industry, Traveloka, perhaps uh, most of you have heard about the name since 10 years ago. We started as an online platform, uh, booking platform, and now we, we shift or transform into Lifestyle Super App because we believe that when we are traveling right now, people don't, don't only think about how to book hotel or flight conveniently, but they also think about the health protocol the convenient and the comfortable of the of the traveling. That said, we try to provide lots of services that basically provide the, the necessity of people of people who travels or people you know to spend some time away from home. Uh, we have multiple pillars of, of services, not only traveling. We have financial services, and right now we have health services, and we have eat delivery. We have lots of product simply because we see that Indonesia is a large uh, market. Indonesia has great potential. And when we talk about digital, there are lots of things that we can play around or we can innovate uh, uh, through digital uh, through digital aspect. Uh, early last year during the pandemic uh, COVID-19, we actually worked with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Tourism to open six uh, vaccination center in Yogyakarta, in Jakarta, in Cengkareng, the airport, as well as in other other places in, in Jabodetabek or Java. Now, uh, we hit uh, tar our target, which is approximately 80,000 people in Indonesia to be vaccinated and booked through our platform. This is the evidence that number one, collaboration is important. Public-private partnership is very, very important, uh, especially for digital uh, transformation or digital ecosystem. Point number two is uh, as a business, as a, a technology company that is that now is operating in six countries, we, uh, we want to be more responsible. We want to care about others. That's why we know that our collaboration for, for vaccine, for COVID vaccination is important, point number one. And point number two, as a company that cares, uh, moving forward, we're not only concerned about how business grow, but we're also concerned about how to maintain ecosystem. So last year, we launched our digital game that encouraged users to, to travel, but also to invest their time and their uh, attention toward the environment issue. So I will stop right here. I know the time is limited, but I'm very happy to, to open for discussion, but I would like to emphasize the importance of a collaboration, public-private partnership here in Indonesia, in Spain, and all over uh, the Asia. We, as a market leader in Southeast Asia, in terms of uh, lifestyle super app, we believe that if we want to grow bigger, then collaboration is, is number one uh, uh, solution. Point number two, as industry, at the moment, COVID has changed our paradigm of thinking. So as industry, we have to make sure that our business growth, but we have to be a more responsible company. And that's where Traveloka is going to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, I will uh, give the floor now, the, the screen, to Marta Nuevo Falguera. Marta. Hello. Uh, buenos dias desde España and uh, Selamat Siang de Indonesia. I'd like to thank uh, first Casa Asia and CSIS Indonesia for inviting me to this event. It's a pleasure being here today to talk about digital innovation in, in Southeast Asia. In these past two years, Southeast Asia has launched many initiatives uh, in the digital domain to fight COVID-19 spread, uh, spread to varying degrees of success, particularly when it comes to contract tracing apps. And uh, similar to EU countries, Southeast Asian countries have uh, taken the Taiwanese model. As an example, Taiwanese model um, has led the way in using uh, artificial intelligence through uh, the combination collaboration of uh, the work of the, uh, of the government of uh, Taiwan First Digital Minister, but also through the expertise of software engineers from the country and the collaboration, most importantly, the collaboration of the local community. And uh, it has been successful so far in tackling two major issues 
uh, that have been like uh, um, going on in the past two years, which is not only COVID, but also the spread of fake news. Uh, they have previous uh, prior experience. Uh, they've had the 2003 SARS outbreak and this information campaigns coming from uh, from mainland China. And uh, through this, they have um, they have developed um, um, apps and contact trace and uh, uh, contact tracing apps through um, to help solve logistic issues and prevent out outbreaks. Uh, for example, there's one uh, that, uh, for example, shop owners added in information on the platform to inform citizens of real-time inventory numbers or the government zero contract tracing initiatives that uh, pioneer this kind of a QR code to enter public venues, something that we are all familiar with nowadays. And uh, most importantly, too, to combat, uh, they have been quite a su successful at combating disinformation and fake news. Uh, through initiatives such as Humor Over Rumor, which is uh, a tool that uses uh, Taiwanese culture, Taiwanese cultural, um, <clears throat> Taiwanese uh, cultural things such, or such as the meme culture to counter fake news. So far, um, Southeast Asia has adopted some of Taiwan's initiatives, uh, particularly those concerning contact tracing apps to combat new outbreaks. Uh, so uh, throughout the region, we have apps like Stay Safe in the Philippines, Peduli Lindungi in Indonesia, and even in Laos, we have Lao KYC. Uh, however, again, similar to some EU countries, and in this case also in Spain with a Radar COVID app, um, these initiatives have experienced major flaws. And uh, so, for example, uh, they have uh, had almost no impact on tracing positive cases. There has been some uh, certain degree of uh, distrust among the citizenship in the government to to, um, to use these apps, so they have not been used that much. And uh, there, are, there has also been some cybersecurity concerns, so there have been data breaches in, in the past, and uh, uh, most especially, uh, there has been no consistency. So when it comes, um, I think, we still have a lot uh, in this domain, a lot to, to work forward to. Uh, also, when it comes to this information, there ha which has been a major issue in the pandemic, government action has not been satisfactory. Uh, in some instances, uh, I mean, like countries like Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam have passed recently uh, laws against the fa uh, fake news. Uh, however, they have been. Um, they have granted broader power to government. And since sometimes uh, there has been some lack of transparency in their implementation process, these laws have, can are open to be misused uh, to silent dissent uh, on the position. Uh, something that uh, we have seen, um, for example, uh, during the, uh, the Philippine elections uh, not so long ago. Um, anyway, uh, battling this information is still an unresolved issue for Southeast Asia. Um, especially um, in Spain too, uh, to a certain degree. Initiatives like the ones launched by the Asia Internet Coalition are rolling out fact-checking and digital literacy programs, but the success of these initiatives will be greater with government support and the right legislation. Also, um, um, I would like to point out, I know that uh, the time is, uh, uh, we, still, we don't have much time. I'd like to, um, point out uh, the task that ASEAN is doing. So despite the differences and this like certain levels of distrust among its member states, ASEAN is playing an active role in propel propelling digital innovation in the region. So for example, early last year, uh, it endorsed an updated digital master plan 2025, uh, which included an early assessment of the impact of COVID. Uh, and it would uh, not only um, help uh, act, like improve uh, Inf um, information uh, related to COVID, to COVID, uh, contact tracing, but also universal. We would provide universal access to e-services, e-education, and e-health, and bring down trade barriers. So it's also like it's not also it doesn't also doesn't own, only want to to tackle COVID. It wants to uh, reinvigorate the region through uh, through COVID, through this sort of digitalization process that COVID has enhanced to increase. Uh, economy and bolster economic recovery in the region. So again, um, and just uh, as a final remark, similar to what the EU does at the European level, ASEAN is said to be a key actor in the rolling out of recommendations and good practices in the digital domain for its member states. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Marta. I really appreciate that you are uh, your discipline to to keep it to five minutes. And now I will give uh, the screen to Rafid Randi, who I believe uh, he has a PowerPoint, right? Mr. Rafid Randi. Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, so um, I would like to share my screen right now. Um, Okay, uh, can you see uh, my screen? See, uh, see, yes, yes, we can see. Okay, okay. thank, thank you. you, thank Perfect. you very much. Yep. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for Casa Asia and also CSIS for inviting me. Um, so I, I think I would like to um, propose um, some some other um, perspective regarding digital innovation, which is uh, trying to see more into the uh, people behavior changes uh, due to the pandemic. Um, so we know that uh, many digital innovations um, actually happened in the pandemic, you know, due to the uh, mobility restriction and also uh, uh, social distancing policy. Um, uh, people start to utilize a digital platform, for example, um, uh, more uh, uh, more uh, extensive than before. So I think uh, this is why uh, digital skills and also digital literacy uh, matters uh, right now. Uh, we know that. Um, the digital skills actually represents a key aspect of the digital economy development. So uh, a country or um, uh, as a global economy can go towards a more inclusive uh, digital transformation. And also uh, I would like to extend that the digital literacy and skills are also the um, one of the important issues that have been discussed in the D D G20 uh, for uh, in this year, Indonesia's presidency. So we have this opportunity to work with the University of Oxford uh, to provide some kind of toolkit that can actually measure uh, digital skills and uh, literacy in the G20 countries. Uh, which uh, we uh, which is supported by the Ministry of um, Communication and Information of Republic of Indonesia, um, building some framework that already developed by UNESCO, ITU, and also other G20 members. And um, uh, we think that there is a uh, a need to have a common framework. For example, um, I think some of the developing countries are uh, they don't really have this kind of toolkit. So I think. Uh, this toolkit will be very beneficial for them to actually measure uh, the quality of digital skills and literacy in uh, respective countries. And also uh, it provides a guidance, obviously for a country uh, to explore the, some of the digital indicators uh, to generate strategic policies. Uh, so this is the, the, the framework that we use. Uh, we have these four pillars. The first one is in infrastructure and cost system. The second one is literacy. The third one is uh, empowerment and the fourth one is jobs. Uh, as you uh, know that infrastructure and ecosystems should be sort of like the basic point of um, digital development. Uh, and this uh, literacy is actually uh, about the, the basic knowledge, for example, uh, uh, critical thinking, um, uh, uh, ICT familiarity, um, all of the basic knowledge about the digitalization. And the third pillar actually talking about how people utilize the digital platforms, whether they use um, e-commerce, they use uh, ride hailing and um, uh, how extensive uh, the society or people actually use the digital platform. And the fourth one is the, the more sophisticated one. We call it a, 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 a jobs pillar. This is how the digital skills can utilize to create uh, 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 jobs and also work and also generating uh, income. So this is just a quote, um, you cannot manage what you can measure. So <laughs> this is what we are trying to do. So we trying to uh, have a framework to measure the digital skills and also digital literacy. Uh, so we did a, quite a bit of survey in, uh, in Indonesia. So uh, I'm just gonna highlight uh, several uh, interesting points. Uh, from the second pillar about the digital literacy, for example, we still have uh, respondents that do not really confident about 
um, uh, uh, using, uh, for example, uh, uh, cloud services platform. They don't really familiar with it. Although uh, there is a quite a lot of uh, work from home trend, uh, for example, and then this is uh, one of the uh, issue that might rise um, if, if we're talking about the communication and collaboration in the digital platform. Uh, there's also uh, a low score in the personal security um, issues. Uh, so I, we, we think that this uh, should be uh, one of the key policies that the government should do. Uh, and then uh, the highest, the highest uh, uh, aspect uh, from the second pillar is the ICT familiarity. So I think um, this is a very good uh, improvement for uh, Indonesia as well. And for the third pillar, um, it's about the empowerment. So how the people actually use uh, the digital platform. Uh, I think we already know that um, the e-commerce is probably the most uh, uh, widely used um, uh, uh, digital platform right now uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but but all, uh, I think 38% um, of respondents were regular users or on a weekly and uh, daily basis of e-commerce platform. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, it's quite sad that the e-learning platforms, uh, it's quite low. It's less than 10% um, of the respondents having used this uh, platform. So I think uh, in terms of the e-learning, we should uh, uh, promote more. Uh, so the digitalization do not really end up with a consumerism, but also um, other things that are productive, for example, um, education. So I think that's all uh, from my um, a presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to, to have a discussion. That's all. Thank you very much, Mr. Rafi Randi, for summarizing uh, your presentation in, in these five minutes. And now we have uh, the last five minutes for our last uh, speaker, Raquel uh, Jorge. So the screen is yours. Thank you. Let me see. Oops. Thank you. Well, so first of all, I wanted to thank the organization of this event because I truly think that it's really highly appreciated to see how a concrete country in the European Union, such as Spain and Indonesia and Southeast Asia, can work together and cooperate much further. So actually, I wanted to talk a bit on some of the points that the rest of colleagues in this panel have already raised, concretely the issue of uh, e-government, but also the issue of digital skills, and also some uh, other points where Spain could contribute as, as such uh, when working or cooperating with Indonesia in already existing initiatives, but also upcoming or potentially positive uh, projects altogether. So, first of all, we see that Spain, after the COVID, or, or still we can say that we are still in the COVID pandemic, Spain are prepared alongside the other EU member states as a package of uh, financial instruments which are under, under the umbrella of the Recovery and Resilience Plan. And we see that, uh, concretely, Spain has con uh, is, is aiming to contribute to this uh, a package of funding, which is called RRP, Recovery and Resilience Plan, through the pillar of digital transition uh, uh, to, a larger, to a large extent. Actually, we see that the green transition is the very first pillar of the plan, which is good, and the digital transition is, this, is the second. One of the most rem remar uh, remarkable points from Spain is that Actually, Spain is trying to contribute to 28% of the total of this funding to the digital transition. And actually, there are several points of several areas of focus. The first is the public administration as such. So how to digitalize the public administration. And Spain is not only doing it from within, but also, for example, in terms of how Spain works with Latin American countries or also under the umbrella of the EU's digital partnership agreements with some Southeast Asian countries. Spain is actually quite positively contributing to, to, to for now, a framing the mandate, so that means that maybe in the future it, uh, it, Spain will have a good potential to contribute as well in terms of execution and implementation of public policies. So that's why the case of Indonesia could be as well a good area of opportunity for both countries. So this is the first um, point in terms of e-government. The second point uh, under the Recovery and Resilience Plan is the issue of uh, cybersecurity. So we see that Spain is one of the highly advanced uh, cyber mature countries in the world. Actually, it's the fourth one alongside others. Southeast Asian countries, such as South Korea. In this case, I think that uh, uh, both strengths and, uh, and the weaknesses that in both Spain and Indonesia, both countries may be facing, it could be a good opportunity for both sides to try to, to convene all together and join up forces. 
This is the second point. The third point from the Spanish perspective, I mean, there are, there are too many points to talk about, but as I, as, I, as I want to stick to five minutes, I think it will be much better to talk about uh, these uh, economic-oriented strategic projects uh, uh, for uh, strategic, strategic, uh, strategic projects for the economy recovery and transformation, which are called as well PERTES, P-E-R-T-E-S. And actually, there are 11 PERTES right now. PERTES are, like, are similar to the European Union's IPSAs, which are incredibly similar. So these are the important projects of common European interest and uh, uh, out of these 11 purchases in Spain, there are four purchases on the electric and connected, uh, and connected car, the economy of the Spanish language, as it was mentioned before, the aerospace industry and the, and the digitalization of the use of water. So in this regard, the Spain is aiming to, uh, to, to bring uh, a funding from both public-private sectors and uh, actually, uh, Spain is also uh, bringing uh, foreign investors, so that means that in the case of Indonesia, it will be as well a good area of, of opportunity. And uh, finally, as I, as I think that I have only one minute left, uh, I wanted to raise the issue of uh, submarine cables or undersea cables. I think this is highly important for both Indonesia and Spain, concretely due to its uh, geographical uh, location, because Indonesia has sea and uh, Spain too. So that means that Spain is a good entry point for, for, the, for the European Union to, 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 uh, for, to, to, the, to the transfer of data and internet traffic from other, from other countries and concretely other continents, such as the African continent, but, but also Latin America. And Indonesia has as well a, a pretty good geographical location, and that means that Spain and Indonesia could work together at least on, on initial talks on how to make these undersea cables issue not only something about economic activities, but also about even geopolitical competition and geopolitical positioning. So with this, I, I'll stop here, but I wanted to raise these four points. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Raquel. Uh, uh, we are going to talk about uh, geopolitics in the next section, and as, as promised, we have, to, we have to finish here, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm back to you, Fitri. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rafael Bueno, as well as uh, the speakers of the first session, uh, Ms. Valguera, uh, Mr. Uh, Dandira Fitrandi, Ms. Vidya, Mr. Raquel for uh, your presentation. Now we will we'll come to the second session uh, that will be moderated by Dr. Lina Alexandra, head of the Department of International Relation, CSIS Indonesia. Dr. Lina, I give you the screen. All right. Thank you very much, Fitri. Uh, we are now moved to the second session which will talk about the Indonesian and Spanish perspectives on the Indo-Pacific. Despite of the common, good to, uh, common goal to promote interconnectivity in order to create common prosperity and peace in the region, we all know in the Pacific concept is a multi-interpretation concept. Almost all major powers and regions have their own definition, including ASEAN with the ASEAN outlook on the pacific This session, aims to share the Spanish and Indonesian perspectives. And we would like to highlight the potential cooperation and collaboration, um, especially between the two countries. We now have four speakers, excellent speakers with us. Um, and I would like to give the first floor to uh, Mr. Muhammad Takdir, the head of the Center for Policy Strategy for the Asia Pacific and Africa, uh, Africa region from the Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and similar to the first session, each speaker will speak for five minutes. I will now give the floor to Mr. Muhammad Takdir. Please, sir. Uh, to the case of uh, Casa Asia, could you please uh, open the camera for Mr. Takdir? Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, first of all, Excellency uh, Ambassador Mura Swajaya, Director General of uh, for American and European Affairs, Excellency Jacques uh, Salido, Director General of North America, Eastern Europe, Asia Pacific, 
uh, of Spain, also Dr. Rizal uh, Damuri of CSIS, and Mr. Xavier Sparodi, Director General of Casa Asia, and all distinguished speakers. My, it's my great honor to be uh, in, uh, on the panel this afternoon. I think uh, talking about in the, in the Pacific, a few uh, of the reasons why in the Pacific is now become, become a global stage for some of important initiatives or because it represents uh, like been said by the, uh, Dr. Risa in the opening, 60% of global GDP and a two-third of global economic uh, growth. And to the, the, the continue a major players engagement in the region uh, on various individual or groups uh, initiatives are making in the Pacific more resembling a multipolar in the Pacific uh, or multipolar region, at least uh, we not several contesting uh, contesting uh, concept the Pacific concepts, including uh, use strategy for corporations in the Indo-Pacific. Among those uh, initiatives, I think AIT finds it's, it's more uh, Indo-Pacific sister with the uh, EU strategy for corporations in the Indo-Pacific. At least I think uh, they both uh, in the case of uh, for synergy in implementing uh, their respective, uh, their respective uh, guidance, the uh, guidance document, they both keen uh, to dilute major uh, power rivalry because the major power rivalry is one of the uh, core uh, 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 situation that we have in the region in the Pacific. IUP itself, uh, the main uh, objective uh, aims at nurturing common interests of countries in the regions by enhancing uh, uh, corporations through four of its cluster uh, uh, corporations uh, and ASEAN centrality, which is clearly, I, I think I found uh, uh, in the in the EU document mentioned, I think uh, 31 uh, times in the Indo-Pacific strategy. And all we are aware of the four cluster, uh, in, uh, they are maritime cooperation, connectivity, uh, UN SDGs, other economic and uh, other economic cooperation. For the latest uh, update on how those cooperations are going to be implemented. Uh, Indonesia has been submitted uh, concept papers uh, mainstreaming for priority areas of the ASEAN outlook uh, on the Indo-Pacific uh, within ASEAN-led mechanisms. I, I think uh, we submitted in the in the uh, early uh, the early year on the February, if I'm not mistaken. And in this regard, through uh, ASEAN uh, Committee Permanent Representative, uh, they will gather unified support for the implementation and identification of actionable program under IRP, IRP itself. Uh, Indonesia is planning for our uh, side, Indonesia is, plan, is planning to uh, hold uh, infrastructure forum, Indo-Pacific Infrastructure Forum on connectivity uh, scheduled to be held, I think in, in 23, uh, as we uh, resume our uh, chairmanship uh, in Asia. And the challenge faced in the countries in the Middle Pacific that we see this, this slide is, is that uh, the vulnerability, the vulnerability encountering uh, by most of the countries in the Pacific based on uh, 2021 fragile state index. Uh, to its docents indicators, uh, I think most of the countries here is categorized with uh, uh, what is it, warning and alert. It's uh, indicated. Uh, 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 Vulnerability uh, through its uh, 12 uh, indicators uh, from social politics to security and, and economy. And it added up the anxiety. It, uh, they are not managed well. The probability uh, we have, we might have, is the in interstate relations fractures, uh, as we see, uh, as we see in the global, uh, in this, in the global. Uh, BRICS report, uh, WF in, uh, Global Risk Report, where interstate track relation fractures becoming uh, top 10 risks by likelihood. And I think it's, it, it's, it's really uh, uh, showcased some of the hotspots in, in the Pacific. And now we see it. Uh, 
I'm sorry, Mr. Takdir. I think you need to wrap up. Uh, your time is finished. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, uh, I think I'll go to the to the last point of uh, probably the presentations. The takeaway from this meeting is uh, is how the Indonesia and Spain in the context of the Pacific and EU strategy uh, to follow up uh, some of the talking points that probably share uh, will, will, will be shared in this forum is uh, that Spain can lead the EU's constructive route toward Asia and expand an intensive dialogue, especially in the one and a half track. And uh, last point is I think of finding a possible cooperations linking the direct interest of Spain and the EU and the regions. I think uh, for the third uh, takeaway, I think connectivity is one of the possible uh, cooperations, knowing that uh, most of the prior activities uh, OIP and post OIP adoption in 2019, uh, we, 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 we focus on, on connectivity. I think that's all. I, I back to you, uh, moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad Takdir. Uh, I will now to uh, I will now move to the second speaker, is Excellency Emilio de Miguel, Ambassador at Large for the Indo-Pacific and Director of Casa Asia Madrid Center, to give your um, presentation. Please. Sir. Good morning to everybody. Spain has chosen not to have its own Indo-Pacific strategy. We prefer to contribute to the drafting of the EU strategy for the region and then to its implementation. We believe the EU is stronger when it is united and its mechanisms allow for defending the national interests while working together in international issues. In January, I was designated ambassador at large for the Indo-Pacific. The first task I was given was to make the mapping of the EU strategy in order to see how our national interests fit in the priorities set by the EU and how Spain can help to the implementation of the strategy. This exercise is practically over. Currently, we are focusing in coordinating with the present and incoming presidencies of the European Union so that the EU policy to the Indo-Pacific has coherence and continuity. There are some, some points I want to stress about the EU strategy. First, the EU wants to engage the region, building partnerships to reinforce the rules-based multilateral order and address global challenges. We are open to have partnerships with any nation or association that wants to work with us. In this respect, Indonesia is mentioned eight times in the strategy and ASEAN a further 15. You can gauge the importance we give to the partnership with Indonesia and ASEAN through these figures. Second, it's a compre comprehensive strategy that takes on board most of the issues. Economic prosperity, green recovery, human security, energy transition, digital governance, and cyber security. For the first time, the US, the EU, says openly that it wants to become an actor in security and defense in the region. One of the ways the EU, uh, one of the ways for the EU to accomplish this ambition is to join the security architecture ASEAN has built around itself. It is the ADMM Plus and the East Asia Summit. Third, it is a realistic strategy. It proposes concrete actions and signals the resources the EU will devote to the attainment of those actions. When I read the ASEAN outlook for the Indo-Pacific, the commonalities between both strategies stroke me. Our respective visions for the region are similar. Both of us want an open, transparent and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Both of us defend an Indo-Pacific where the international law is respected including UNCLOS. The EU supports the centrality of ASEAN in the, in the Indo-Pacific. We count on ASEAN's experience on creating consensus and managing a regional architecture. In this respect, 
I think it's a, it is an anomaly, the fact that the EU has not yet joined the East Asia Summit and the ADMM+. The EU and ASEAN have been partners for 45 years, and two years ago we upgraded our partnership to the category of strategic. Through its strategy for the Indo-Pacific and the recent forum held in Paris last February, the EU has proved its engagement with the region and its added value even in issues that have been traditionally out of EU's scope, such as security and defense. Therefore, I hope the, an the anomaly I mentioned will be over soon. In the meantime, I want to overview the areas where our strategies overlap and we should work together to create synergies. First, it is maritime cooperation. The Indian and Pacific Oceans represent the biggest maritime space in the planet. The US strategy devotes one of its seven priorities to ocean governance. The, the fight against IUU fishing, the creation of a regional ocean forecasting system, pollution prevention, these are some of the actions the EU wants to adopt. Besides that, in security and defense, the EU wants to promote regional maritime security, mainly through Climario program to enhance the maritime capacities of our partners to better control their seas and through ESIWA. Our approach is in full compliance with UNCLOS. Second is connectivity. The EU is aware of the deficit of infrastructures in the region, but we believe in infrastructures that are financially, socially, and environmentally sustainable. The December 2020 joint EU ASEAN Ministerial Declaration on Connectivity marks the way we could cooperate on connectivity. Economic cooperation. I'm sorry, I think your time is up. Just can you just wrap up? Sorry about that. A, a last sentence. In short, there are commonalities in many fields open to our work together. Will we have the political will? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. So we will now move to the third speaker. It's uh, Dr. Javier Gil, Professor of International Relations from Universidad Pontificia Comilas. Please, sir. Morning. Um, first, um, I would like to express my gratitude to Casa Asia and the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Indonesia. I have to say that in 2006, I was a visiting fellow in, in the Center of, for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta. So I'm very happy and very pleased, you know, uh, to meet again with people, you know, for that center. Well, um, I have five minutes, so I will, I will summarize my presentation. First, I will explain how I see the Indo-Pacific. And then I will comment briefly three areas where Spain and Indonesia can cooperate you know, with each other. Uh, the first, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I see the Indo-Pacific as a very complex uh, region, extremely fragmented. Uh, politically speaking, we find different you know, political uh, systems, sultanates, uh, military dictatorships, you know, uh, communist countries uh, of full-fledged democracy. So in terms of political situation, it's, it's quite fragmented and complex. Uh, in terms of uh, the territory, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, we find uh, two vast oceans, the Indian Ocean and the, and the, and the Pacific Ocean, and our mass land of uh, land, basically comprising the totality of you know, Central Asia, South Asia, and the totality of, uh, of, the, of the Far East. And we find also two important, and two, you know, important archipelagos, you know, the Filipino archipelago and the Indonesian archipelago, situated you know, uh, in the center of the uh, in, in the center of the Indo-Pacific region. So basically the role of Indonesia, I think, is, is very important. It's a dynamic region, uh, basically the, uh, in terms of uh, the economic situation, basically the totality of the countries in the area, uh, their economies are, are growing. So I think that is quite positive. Uh, but basically it's an area where we see, you know, what they call bilateral and multilateral confrontation. India versus China, United States versus China, India versus Pakistan, and then multilateral initiatives no, that are very interesting. For example, the AUKUS you know, between uh, Australia, United States, uh, and United Kingdom, or the Quad, you know, 
uh, with four countries, uh, Australia, uh, Japan, India, and United States. So basically bilateral uh, confrontation or bilateral tension and multilateral tension. I think that, that point is quite important. Um, basically, just to summarize, was the Indo-Pacific is a key area because you know, uh, it represents 60% you know, of the global population, 60% more or less of the uh, global we wealth of the, of the world. So it's crucial for the present and it's crucial for the future. In terms of cooperation between Spain and Indonesia, I think we have to be very realistic. I think that we have to assume that some areas where we can complement you know, uh, both countries. And that's the reason because I selected you know, three, uh, three areas. The first one is the stability. Uh, we have to cooperate in the stability and freedom of uh, navigation, uh, especially with three initiatives. First, to reduce uh, the pollution in the seas. Uh, and basically to, uh, to improve uh, the productivity of the, of the fishing resources that are key for both countries because we are maritime countries. Second, I think Spain has a vast experience you know, combating piracy and criminality in the seas and I think that in this area I think Spain can you know, complement Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is a vast archipelago, um, it's affected by piracy, it's affected by for example illegal fishing, especially in the South China Sea and especially in the area of the Natuna archipelago. So I think in that area, Spain and Indonesia can cooperate each other. And third, I think that we, you know, both countries, you know, uh, uh, support, you know, United Nations Convention of the Long Sea, the UNCLOS. I think that, you know, we should defend, we, we should promote, you know, UNCLOS as the cornerstone for, you know, resolving, you know, territorial disputes or basically maritime disputes, especially in the case of the South China Sea and especially taking into account the problematic, the problem, you know, with the Natuna archipelago and the uh, Chinese claims. The second area where I think it's interesting is basically uh, promoting research and innovation. Uh, I think in, in, in this area we have to promote more exchange to exchange you know, uh, promotion. For example, yesterday I received the rector of the Institute Pertanian Indonesia, Bogor, uh, Mr. Arif Satria, um, because he's very interested in promoting you know, the connection between Spanish universities and the Institute Pertanian of Bogor, the most important, the number one university in agriculture studies in, in, in Southeast Asia. So basically we can cooperate in the, in the areas of the productivity of uh, agriculture, in the production and the productivity of the fishing resources. And we can cooperate and we should cooperate in the area of non-traditional security issues, especially um, how to avoid and mitigate natural disasters, uh, how to avoid and mitigate, and mitigate the global pandemics, no? especially taking into account that both countries were highly affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I have one more minute. So I would like to, uh, you know, uh, to just to come briefly another sector where I think is, is important we should cooperate is the area of security. I think in the area of terrorism, I think Indonesia has enough capabilities, you know, to, to combat terrorism. I think they are, they are doing a, a wonderful job. But I think in the area of weapons smart destruction, you know, I think this is a global issue. And Spain, Indonesia, ASEAN, European Union, we should cooperate uh, basically to avoid, you know, because basically the production first and then the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, chemical, uh, biological, and nuclear weapons. So that's all. Thank you again. Um, Thank you very much, Professor Hill. Uh, just uh, wrap on time. Thank you very much. So now we move to the fourth speaker, last but not least, Dr. Shafia Fifi Mohibak, the Deputy Executive Director for Research uh, from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Indonesia. Please, Dr. Fifi. Thank you so much, um, moderator. Um, a very good afternoon um, from Jakarta. Um, it's a pleasure for me to join uh, this um, webinar today. Um, previous speakers have all mentioned about the significance of Indo-Pacific region. So I think it's very apparent that the significance is not only felt by countries within the region, uh, but it also has um, gained high interest uh, globally from, from all of the other regions um, in the world. Um, from, an Indo from an Indonesian perspective, um, our concern for Indo-Pacific basically consists of four issues. First is that um, Southeast Asia lies in the geographic midpoint between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. So we are basically at the center uh, of the dynamics uh, of the Indo-Pacific. Um, second, that there is a need uh, to avoid the region from being a region of competition or worse, uh, a region of confrontation. And I think this has also been emphasized uh, by the previous speakers. 
third, uh, there is a need to mitigate trends of polarization between major powers. I think the, the, the biggest challenge and the biggest concern from all Southeast Asian countries is that we might become um, uh, at the center of the uh, competition between the major powers. Uh, and lastly, uh, is that there is a need to avoid the marginalization of ASEAN-led regional architecture uh, and that the, the need to, uh, to, to maintain ASEAN status as a convener and driver uh, of all agendas in the Indo-Pacific. So with these four points in mind, uh, the commonly portrayed um, vision of Indo-Pacific uh, by from an Indonesian perspective is that is one that envision a uniting or harmonizing uh, driver of competing visions uh, of, of the Indo-Pacific. Because uh, as we've discussed, um, there are uh, various understanding, various visions of Indo-Pacific um, expressed by, by, by various countries. So Indonesia's um, ambition is actually to be a uniting uh, or harmonizing driver of all this uh, of all these uh, different visions um, Indonesia promoted the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific um, which has been portrayed uh, as something being in the middle acting as a balancer and harmonizer uh, of this uh, competing strategies of great powers uh, while at the same time also aims to capture the opportunities uh, and safeguard um, ASEAN's place uh, in the Indo-Pacific region we can, of course, in, we, we've also uh, heard about various criticisms towards the ASEAN outlook, but I think that's, uh, that's another discussion. Um, domestically, uh, there are, of course, also drivers for Indonesia to play um, an important role in the Indo-Pacific, uh, which include, among others, uh, this uh, ambition to also have uh, regional stability for a safe environment uh, for development uh, and also um, a peaceful, basically, um, region. And then also uh, the second one is the rising importance of the maritime domain um, to bring the extent of potential of the Indonesian archipelago or Indonesia as a maritime nation. So uh, basically all of this, uh, the vision is um, uh, openness, transparency and inclusivity for the Indo-Pacific uh, that unites rather than divides. And this in here exactly will uh, lie the role uh, of ASEAN as a regional institution. Now, um, uh, Indonesia's uh, responsibility and diplomatic track record have also proved um, uh, its role uh, as, you know, for all of this uh, that I've mentioned before, the, 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 the balancer, the harmonizer, and so on. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, and according uh, to some, Indonesia is also trying to fulfill its role uh, as a middle power by, you know, being a good international citizen, coalition builder, bridge builder, uh, and so on. And I think uh, Indonesia is need, uh, aims to be leveraged as the intersection between partners, between rivals, uh, and most of all, creating uh, cooperation uh, in the region. Now, there are, of course, um, challenges to this. Uh, at the same time, challenges to ASEAN to play a greater role. There are also uh, challenges to Indonesia in trying to work together with its uh, Southeast Asian partners into creating this peaceful uh, region of Indo-Pacific that is uh, dominated by more cooperation. Uh, the first challenge is uh, basically, for, uh, from an ASEAN point of view, is basically the ASEAN unity. Uh, ASEAN has been less able to speak in one voice to uh, respond to uh, threats uh, or challenges uh, that is created or that comes from uh, the competitive nature uh, of the great powers. Uh, and second of all, proliferation of ASEAN-centered multilateral processes and platforms um, means sustainability could be dependent on the interests of, of dialogue partners. So um, basically, as time is limited, uh, maybe I'll um, list uh, some ideas, some final notes uh, that I think might be useful, uh, looking again from the Indonesian perspective and an ASEAN perspective. Um, I think the, the success for uh, both Indonesia and ASEAN to uh, actually achieve all of these ambitions that it has with regards to Indo-Pacific uh, will be dependent um, and uh, on its relations with its direct neighbors uh, in East Asia, I suppose. And that there, that's why forums like the East Asia Forum um, is gaining more and more relevance in terms of how ASEAN uh, seeks to project uh, its ideas uh, in the future. Um, there are still um, concerns whether or not ASEAN will be able to actually transform the ASEAN outlook into being something uh, that is implementable, but I think that's that's a real challenge that ASEAN needs to face. 
Um, and I think uh, the we mentioned about uh, different initiatives, different multilateral uh, um, efforts, such as we mentioned AUKUS, and then there are uh, all others like Quad. Uh, these strategic initiatives uh, are conducted without prior diplomatic communication to ASEAN, which has uh, resulted in concerns about, about the importance of ASEAN to extra regional powers beyond economic cooperation. So I think um, in, in ASEAN's effort to nurture uh, cooperation with its, uh, be it dialogue partners or uh, uh, various other partners that it has, including in this regard with Spain, I think um, it's, it, it needs to uh, keep underlying the importance of ASEAN as a vehicle for, um, for regional interaction uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Lina. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shafia. Uh, so, unfortunately, we ran out of time, so we don't really have time for question and answers. Um, so I will now hand over uh, the time to Dr. Fitriani. I hope everyone still uh, get the, the key points of the presentation. I think it's, it's uh, which, which are very, very important. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lina Alexandra, Mr. Mohamed Takdir, Ambassador Emilio de Miguel, Mr. Javier Gia, and Dr. Uh, Safia Muhibat for your excellent time and presentation. We have concluded the two session of the Indonesia Spain Forum 2022. But before ending today's event, I would like to welcome the closing remarks from Indonesia and Spain representative who have collaborated to make this event possible. I would like to invite, firstly, His Excellency Ambassador Francisco de Aziz Aguilera Aranda, Ambassador of Spain to Indonesia, to give his closing remarks. To Ambassador Aranda, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Fitriani. Um, uh, well, good morning and good afternoon to everyone, uh, our dear colleagues and friends in Madrid and Spain, our dear colleagues and friends over here in, in Jakarta. Actually, for me, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have been able to witness this exchange. My personal conclusion is that uh, definitely this is not enough. We need to have some more sessions like this because there are so many things we have to share together as two countries. We have to learn from each other. And for me, it has been very interesting to pay attention to the details and the discussion about both the uh, connectivity issues and the Indo-Pacific. Actually, the idea of connectivity in the, uh, comes to my mind as perhaps the key question or the key issue we should be able to cultivate in our understanding. We have to be able to connect, to create connectivity in the technological sense of view, of course, in the technological uh, instruments that we have over here in our, in our market economy and all the technological elements that we have available right now. And the connectivity and the uh, development of the technological- Recording in progress. Uh, and the technological um, aspects of this connectivity are very much well developed over here in Indonesia and also in Spain. And this is something where we should be able to work together, but also in the field of Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is a, an idea which has become now the rule, the norm for everyone, and uh, that we all have to follow. In that respect, Indonesia is an Indo-Pacific country, Spain is not but we are very much keen to participate in the developments of the region. We are interested, we all belong to one single world, and definitely we want to uh, express our interest and our, and our understanding of the, of the future of the region, a region we expect and we want to be peaceful, well-connected, uh, law-abiding, and definitely open to the prosperity of everyone, and where we also believe that part of the, our future is as well. So from that point of view, thank you very much to all and everyone involved in this uh, conversation today. Thank you, Ambassador Angura. Thank you, uh, my dear colleagues in Madrid, uh, Director Parrondo and, and Salido, and our the colleagues in, in the Ministry and, and Casa Asia, and uh, over there. And over here as well, my colleagues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the CSIS, uh, Traveloc, and the other institutions participating today. This is just, or should be the beginning of something bigger which uh, allows us to connect together, to work together, and to ensure that uh, two nations, two middle powers, uh, separated by many kilometers of distance, but not so much in terms of interests and values, can work together and work together for, for a better world. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for the excellent closing remark, Ambassador Aranda. Uh, last but not least, I welcome His Excellency Murah Swajaya, Director General for American and European Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, to give his closing remarks. To Excellency Swajaya, the screen is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ibu Fitriani. A very good afternoon and also uh, good morning uh, to our colleagues participating in this uh, very important gathering. I should uh, address our colleague, uh, Director General uh, Salido, uh, and also Ambassador uh, Aguera and uh, Dr. Fermonte, uh, as well as Mr. Parondo. I would like to uh, extend uh, our uh, appreciation for organizing this event. Uh, in fact, I was supposed to be here as well at the uh, opening of this event, but since uh, emergency things always came up, so then I'm, I, I have to apologize that I was not able to be here together with you in, in the morning, but I have uh, a good opportunity to also uh, give some uh, short remark at the end of this uh, conversation. First, I think uh, I'm very happy that uh, what we have already started uh, last year uh, continues with the conversation that we have uh, today. And I think this is a very important and very crucial uh, exercise. And uh, as Ambassador mentioned earlier, of course, this is uh, only the beginning of uh, bigger activities uh, that should follow up this uh, conversation. Uh, number two, I would like to commend uh, OCSIS and also CASA uh, Spain for uh, taking this initiative. And I think uh, a frank discussion like this on what is happening in, in both of our region is uh, very important for us to uh, have a better understanding. And of course, by having a better understanding, then of course we will be able to identify what are the potential corporations that we could uh, promote. Uh, as we have seen now, the bilateral cooperation between Indonesia and Spain is uh, growing from strength to strength. And we hope that this will be enhanced uh, further uh, in the future. And this is one of the components of this uh, bilateral cooperation that we have between uh, Indonesia and Spain. The third point I would like to make here, uh, certainly, uh, Indo-Pacific is a buzzword, and, and I'm very happy to also uh, inform our participants here. We just concluded uh, the ASEAN-US uh, Special Summit in Washington, D.C. This is the first uh, in-person summit uh, attended by the ASEAN leaders. And again, the issue of Indo-Pacific uh, is also the highlight of that particular summit. And we are also very happy that the U.S. is also acknowledging the importance of the ASEAN outlook of the Indo-Pacific and also the need to promote synergy between the uh, uh, US uh, strategy on the Indo-Pacific. On uh, what new uh, strategy that has already been developed here, of course, it is not only collaboration on the issue of uh, security and defense, but also uh, the issue of uh, economic cooperation connectivity, infrastructure development, addressing the global health uh, pandemic, as well as climate change are very much the highlights of the collaboration that we uh, agree to uh, promote between uh, ASEAN and the US. And we are hoping that uh, in the uh, next summit in November, uh, the leaders of ASEAN and the US will be able to adopt uh, the status or level of the uh, partnership between ASEAN and the US into a strategic comprehensive uh, partnership, which is the highest level of partnership that ASEAN has uh, so far. So uh, within that context as well, uh, of course, I should also mention here that we are looking forward for the ASEAN EU Summit, which is also scheduled to be held in uh, December. And I think uh, we have already elevated the partnership between ASEAN and the EU into the strategic partnership. So what we need to do now is to elaborate 
what are the activities in this context, in the context of the strategic partnership that we need to kind of collaborate. One of the important things when we are talking about the issue of uh, the Indo-Pacific is the agreement between uh, the ASEAN leaders and the EU, as well as the individual uh, countries in the European Union, I believe, Spain is also having the same uh, views on that, is the need to synergize the uh, ASEAN also from the Indo-Pacific and the EU uh, strategy of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. We have a number of similar things that we need to collaborate, and we hope that ASEAN will be able to uh, elaborate in great detail what are the activities uh, that ASEAN would like to uh, promote in terms of promoting dialogue, promoting collaboration, cooperation, and trying to also bridge the gap uh, to narrow the distrust that has already been happening due to so many events and uh, dynamic of it, and the, 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 uh, the uh, geopolitical dynamic. So we hope that we will be able to uh, start with uh, corporate activities that we will be able to pursue between Indonesia and the EU. And at the same time, of course, we look forward to collaboration, enhancing the partnership between uh, Indonesia uh, and Spain, including also on this uh, issue. And last but not least, uh, certainly when uh, we are talking about uh, connectivity, when we are talking about technology, I think this is also uh, a very good uh, areas that we could uh, promote between Indonesia and, and Spain. And you know that uh, the uh, digital transformation is also uh, the priorities, uh, one of the three priorities of Indonesia G20 uh, uh, presidencies. And the potential is huge. And I think we need also, in addition to the issue of freedom of navigation, in addition to the issue of upholding international law, uh, peaceful settlement of disputes, we need to also identify a number of concrete collaborations where people, uh, two people could also uh, interact uh, in a more intensive as well as uh, in a mutually uh, beneficial uh, partnership between uh, Indonesia uh, and Spain. And uh, of course, within this context, we understand that we are now uh, living in a uh, uh, really uh, uncertain uh, situation. We understand that there is a uh, uh, war happening in, in Europe. And I think our position as Indonesia is consistent. With it. We need to really call for the end of this uh, conflict because when this is going to be prolonged, this is not only uh, to put jeopardy to the people of Russia as well as the people of Ukraine, most importantly, of course, they are the one who uh, is uh, suffering the most, but also to the people all over the world. And now people are talking about uh, the potential uh, economic crisis that perhaps would also happen because of the high inflation and also the economic stagnation. So this uh, general situation in the world, we need to really uh, pay attention and how ASEAN EU collaboration, Indonesia, Spain collaboration could also contribute in addressing what we have in the future uh, in front of us, as well as how we will be able to uh, really uh, develop this partnership for mutual uh, benefits uh, in order to uh, fulfill our vision. When we are talking about Indo Pacific, the vision is, of course, Indo Pacific, which is peaceful, secure, and also prosperous. So that is what we need uh, to do. And I would like to uh, thank and I, I endorse some of the views and mentioned by some of the speakers uh, in this uh, conversation. And I think we need to continue this very important conversation between Indonesia uh, and Spain, as well as Indonesia and the EU, ASEAN and the EU. And at the end of the day, of course, in the context of the uh, successful presidency of Indonesia and the G20. So I would like to, uh, uh, again, congratulate all of the speakers and also commend the uh, CSIS and uh, Casa Spain uh, for this very important uh, initiative. And I hope to see you again next year. Thank you. 
Thank you for your excellent closing remarks, uh, Your Excellency Ngurah Swajaya. If I may uh, ask you to stay at your place, and if I may invite all the participant speaker, um, uh, distinguished honorable speakers that are with me in the Zoom meeting to turn on uh, your camera so we can at least see eye to eye uh, and hopefully maybe next year we would have the pleasure of the company uh, of you all to to meet and exchange uh, our thoughts um, further so thank you so much ladies and gentlemen we finally come to the end of the indonesia spain forum 2022 on behalf of csis indonesia casa asia as well as both ministries, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain, I would like to give my deepest appreciation for your participation and attendance. Maybe we can smile to the camera to make the photo. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I thank you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable speaker and distinguished participant and audience. We hope to see you next year at the Indonesia Spain Forum 2023. Until then, stay healthy and I wish you uh, always in good spirit. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.